I was uh, flattered when Dick asked me to give this talk. Uh, I was the MC for the 25th, 30th, and 35th anniversary celebrations, and uh, not in my wildest imagination would I believe I'd be back here tonight for the 50th. But uh, I am, and uh, so I'm happy to be here. Now, <clears throat> when Dick was talking to me about what to talk about, he failed to mention whether it was an honorarium or not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I asked him what I should talk about, he says, tell stories, you know, lots of stories. And I've found over the years that by listening carefully to what Dick said, I've been able to solve a lot of problems. So I started thinking, and I realized, hmm, I do know a lot of stories, some very interesting stories. So I made a few phone calls, and I'd identify myself and say, you know, I'm giving a, <laughs> I'm giving a talk at the uh, reunion, and they've asked me to tell interesting stories about things that happened over the history of the department. And then I'd say, you remember the time? And this is usually followed by a few seconds of silence and a question, how much? <laughs> so, let's see here. Oh, I made a few notes to myself. This one says, Kurt, Michael, and Al Heath are still short. Uh, this one says, uh, get car title from Jim Godwin. <laughs> Uh, so, Dick, it worked. Thank you. Nice honorarium. <laughs> Seriously, um, I didn't call Alex Dessler uh, for two reasons. First, uh, Alex is so dull and boring, I couldn't really find anything incriminating to talk about. <laughs> and second, everybody that knows Alex knows he's so tight with his money, I'd never be able to collect. <laughs> and the way they work, <clears throat> it's a little thing about the size of a fountain pen. And it has a hole in one end and two leads that come off the other end. And we had two doors on the bottom of the payload. One covered the moon sensor and the other covered the particle detectors as Hugh Anderson was flying. And so <clears throat> the way to keep the rocket uh, payload balanced when it was launched is to get rid of both doors simultaneously. And the best way to do that is tie them together with a cable through the middle of the, of the payload. And then when you fire this thing, the guillotine hardened blade chops the cable, and both doors come off at the same time. Now this thing is totally harmless. You can hold one in your hand when it goes off. Explosion is completely contained in a little metal bellows, and it sort of pops, and that's it. But uh, this guy, at this point, was not really happy about it. <laughs> so we had to open the crate, take the uh, cable cutters out, <clears throat> and then he happily inspected the rest of it, and they shipped it up to Alaska. Now, some of you are paying attention realize there's still a problem here. Because the payload has gone, but we don't have the cable cutters in there. So the next question is, how do we get the cable cutters? Well, the answer is, boarding pass. This is before TSS. We just put them in our pockets and walked aboard. <laughs> Nobody had anything to say about it. OK, so once we got up to Alaska, we had a lot of adventures, uh, most of them good. Uh, one in particular that, that uh, stands out, uh, <clears throat> Jean Sessiano, who is my third graduate student, uh, was from Switzerland. And he liked tromping around in the snow. And the temperature outside might be anywhere from 40 to 60 below. But he would go out there. And if we were there during the day to charge batteries or whatever, he'd go exploring. And so he found this moose carcass. And it's not clear what caused the moose to meet his end, but in the meantime, wolves had come and sort of dismembered the carcass, and for reasons totally unknown, John decided that the hindquarter of the moose would make a good souvenir to take back to Houston. <laughs> <clears throat> so he lugs this thing into the blockhouse when nobody's looking and stashes it under a cabinet and leaves it there. Now, at 40 to 60 below zero, a moose carcass, even a couple of weeks old, is not really offensive. But after several days in the blockhouse at 65 degrees, you begin to notice certain uh, characteristic odors. And at first, people suggested it was time for Jean to take a bath, but it became clear it was much more uh, involved than that. So we did a search, and we found the moose leg and explained to Jean it belonged to the wolves, and the wolves should have it back. 
which, which was very disappointing to him. So he hauled it out and gave it back to the, to the wolves. And a couple of days later, Randy Wagner, who did our, our countdown, came into the blockhouse and said, what is that smell? Is there a dead mouse in here? And we said, you're only off by one vowel. <laughs> now, now, in retrospect, it might have been more fun to let John try to take it back in his check luggage to Houston. But uh, anyway, so be it. That was, that was pretty much it. So uh, anyway, we had great adventures there. And a number of people who are uh, present here uh, now uh, participate in that. Over the course of about five or six years, uh, we launched uh, 12 successful launches over the Aurora. Uh, there were about 14 PhDs produced between Hugh and myself on that program. Now, in the meantime, the whole field was changing, and it was moving toward very large missions like planetary missions. And so I became interested in the solar wind interaction with planetary atmospheres. The reason I became interested in solar wind interaction with planetary atmospheres was Eldex came to my office and said, get interested in solar wind interaction with planetary atmospheres. <laughs> and, and remarkably, Kurt got interested in it at the same time, probably because Alex told him exactly the same thing at the same time. So Kurt and I started working on models of solar interaction with planetary atmospheres, and that sort of turned into uh, a 25-year, 30-year uh, work for me and uh, was very interesting to me, and uh, we made a lot of progress, and eventually 15 PhDs came off the data that we got from uh, uh, originally Pioneer Venus and then uh, Mars Global Surveyor. Now, uh, Kurt and I uh, worked on models. Kurt pretty much took the lead in showing me how to do the models, but we did them all on an IBM 1620 that was over in the Ryan Engineering Building. The 1620 had a total memory of 20K core memory, which occupied one cubic foot volume and cost about $30,000. I checked the newspaper uh, a couple of mornings ago. You can buy a terabyte of memory at Fry's for 60 bucks, and it's about that big. So that sort of shows you how far we've come. In any case, we uh, did a lot of work and got involved on some spacecraft missions where uh, we helped with the planning of the mission, particularly Pioneer Venus, which was Pioneer 12. And in those days, they really knew how to build spacecraft. Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 were the first spacecraft to leave the solar system. Pioneer 12 was Pioneer Venus, and it was planned to work for about two years, and it worked for 14. And our instruments were still working 14 years later. Now, also during the time early on, Alex and I were uh, part of a contingent of Americans, there were seven total, invited to go to Moscow uh, for the first bilateral conference on planetary atmospheres. And uh, because this was the height of the Cold War, it hadn't thawed yet, uh, the State Department got involved. And so they briefed us on various things like uh, basically how to handle ourselves while the Russians were trying to compromise us. So they said, expect, and the hotel we stayed in, by the way, was totally run by the KGB. That's the only hotels they would let foreigners stay in. And so they, the State Department briefed us on what we could and couldn't do. Like, for example, if you get back to your room, you open the door, and there's a woman in your bed, you don't go in. You slam the door and go back and complain loudly. Because if you go in, several big goons from the KGB will come in, beat you up, and then haul you off for interrogation. So they said, expect everything you say or do is going to be filmed. But they realized they were talking to the wrong bunch, and one of the guys said, well, if I do get filmed in a compromising situation, can the State Department get a copy for me to bring back and show my friends? <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, I said earlier that Alex is dull and boring, but I'm going to tell you a story now that indicates he's actually pretty wild and crazy. Because what, whereas Alex and I managed to keep our uh, noses clean for a week, at the end of the time, we were all getting kind of stir-crazy, and Alex said, Let's send ourselves a postcard. Remember that, Alex? Now, everybody in this hotel, the desk clerks, all of the people that work in the hotel are KGB. So Alex and I make a big show of going and buying a postcard with the rubles the Russians had provided for us. So we went around the corner and we made out the postcards. Postcards looked like a regular postcard. On one side is a picture. I think mine was red square. On the other side, there's two different uh, spaces. One space is for the address, the other space is for the message and the stamp, you know, 
having a wonderful time, wish you were here, all that stuff. But Alex said, let's just address it to ourselves with no message. <laughs> so <laughs> we filled it out, one to uh, Comrade Destler and one to Comrade Cloutier, and dropped them in the mailbox right in front of the KGB clerk, and then came back to Houston and waited to see how long they would take to get back to us. <laughs> Well, I don't know when Alex has got back, but mine took six months and looked like used Kleenex tissue by the time it finally got back to me. Because the conclusion is obvious. They say, there must be a message here somewhere. <laughs> so they used razor blades and slit the edge of the thing. They boiled it, x-rayed it, fluoroscoped it. We figured the KGB did that for three months, and then the CIA did it for the next three. <laughs> anyway, it finally showed up. So as I said, just an example that Alex is actually not quite as dull and boring as what I said earlier. Now, um, as, the, uh, as the missions um, went on, uh, the, the role of graduate advisors and the role of graduate students changed considerably because instead of building this in the labs like a lot of these guys did, now they're being built at major centers with the spacecraft itself being built by somebody like Boeing or Lockheed. And you basically delivered an instrument already calibrated that was put on the spacecraft and launched. And so uh, the hands-on part sort of disappeared. However, that was compensated for by the fact that we were doing really big, long missions to planets like Venus and Mars. And I made it a point to try to bring as many graduate students with me whenever I went to these meetings, uh, which were held two or three times a year as I could. And there are a number of graduate students here in the room tonight who remember participating in those, which produced a kind of interesting effect because I was apparently the only one that thought the graduate students should go to the meetings, and I'd arrive sometimes with five or six graduate students. Now, one time when we arrived, uh, there was a big convention in town, and all the vehicles of any size were rented, except for one. It was a burgundy-colored Cadillac sedan with burgundy leather interior. <laughs> And uh, I think the people who were along, uh, uh, it was Leonard Kramer, uh, Shannon Walker, uh, maybe Colin Law. Mark, were you there? Mark Matney? Okay, anyway, we had four students and me. Well, Leonard somewhere, somehow, came up with a hat like flamenco dancers wear with the little tassels and declared he was going to be our driver. <coughs> and the students prom promptly dubbed this car the Pimp Mobile. <laughs> and so we pull up in front of the building uh, in Ames with all of these scientists who just drove there with a little you know, miniature Japanese car and we pull up with this burgundy Cadillac <laughs> and, and uh, Leonard gets out and opens the door for me and from then on they, they would wait to go into the meeting to see what my vehicle was when I arrived with my graduate students. <laughs> well, there are a whole lot of stories, some others that I could also tell in polite company, but I'm running out of time. So I, I just wanted to uh, say a few words about uh, what a pleasure it is to be here and to see so many people in the audience. You know, uh, the thing that has impressed me is how much import these you people have had uh, across a wide range of disciplines uh, disproportionate to the size of the department. Uh, Mario Acuna, who I worked with for years, used to refer to us as the Rice Mafia and said we were like cockroaches. <laughs> Wherever he would go, there'd be one slithering around somewhere. And uh, you have basically uh, spread Rice's reputation in a very positive way uh, in a lot of places. Um, <clears throat> also, in the process, uh, of course, some of you have made uh, public names for yourselves. Kay and I were going to a wedding in Alabama uh, about a year ago, and uh, when we came off the plane in Birmingham Airport, they were playing a uh, video of significant things in Alabama, and I look up, and there's a picture of Jerry Fishman uh, taken at Marshall. And uh, so Kay said, don't we know that guy? And I said, oh, that's just Fishman. <laughs> but seriously, uh, most of you know that Jerry won a million, was a co-winner of a million dollar prize, the Shaw Prize in astronomy, for his work on the distribution of gamma ray bursts. And, uh, oh, by the way, uh, Al says that he's totally responsible for that, and he wants to know when the check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, anyway, congratulations again, Jerry. That was a great talk you gave today. And, and uh, if you haven't had a chance to shake Jerry's hand, uh, by all means, seek him out and do it. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, interesting interaction I had lately, uh, we have in, in this room our own Houston astronaut, Shannon Walker, and her husband, Andy Thomas. <clears throat> uh, together, together they have uh, about a year uh, in orbit, uh, and that's besides our other astronaut here, Jim Newman, who you've heard from earlier. Uh, they have about a year in orbit, and Shannon, uh, I get together with graduate students down in the Clear Lake area who work at NASA, uh, and Shannon was in the last group uh, meeting for lunch after she had flown. And so uh, this was at the time that Dennis Tito had announced that he was going to send a married couple on a 500-day mission around Mars. So I said, Shannon, you know, you and your husband are ideal candidates for this if you volunteer. <laughs> and her answer was very short to the point. She said, we'd kill each other. <laughs> so I concluded that Tito needs to change his requirements slightly. It's okay to send a married couple, provided they aren't married to each other. <laughs> well, <clears throat> uh, I'm running out of time, so I just want to say a few words uh, about... Uh, the experiences, my experiences over 50 years. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, it's something that you really have to think about a lot to understand the full impact of 50 years, nearly 50 years of being associated with Rice. I, I came here 49 years ago, so I've, I've been here for almost all that time. And part of the impact is running across the Rice Mafia in so many different areas, so many sub-disciplines. Um, you guys have done a lot to be proud of. You've achieved uh, distinction in many sub-areas. You not only worked in those sub-areas, but in some cases you actually formed those areas. And then you worked with them and brought people along and led those and still lead them today. So I think you have a lot to be proud of and I commend you <coughs> for that work. The other thing is, all of us understand, especially the people who are experimentalists here, that we didn't do it by ourselves. We have had, <coughs> for five decades, the benefit of a lot of really good people. Uh, technical staff, engineers, technicians, clerical staff, administrative staff. I'm the first to admit that uh, Dell only probably gets more credit for my PhD than I do. And I would like all of us to acknowledge that these have been the wind, the, the wind beneath our wings and give them a round of applause. <clears throat> and last but certainly not least, I remind everyone again <clears throat> that this whole enterprise, this very successful 50-year experiment, is due to the drive and foresight and initiative and sometimes plain irony uh, stubbornness, known in Texas as true grit, of our founder and godfather, Alex Dessler. And I ask you to join me. <clears throat> I ask you to join in the standing ovation for Alex. Now, I want to also point out that there are three people in the audience who actually taught me in graduate courses at Rice. Neil Lane, Kurt Michael, and Alex Dessler. But I want to warn you in advance, don't ask them anything about what kind of student I was, because at their advanced age, their memories have gone. You know, just <laughs> don't go there. Just don't even discuss it with them. <laughs> well, as I said, I was the uh, MC for the 25th, 30th, and 35th reunions, and I'd like to close tonight with the same words I used at close of the 25th. <clears throat> I'm honored to count the most distinguished among you as classmates, friends, and colleagues. I'm also privileged to have taught the great majority of you, and I learned much in the process. But above all, 
It's been my great pleasure and good fortune to personally know all of you. And my life is much richer for it. Thank you.